Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Today, we're going to talk about depression and anxiety. And we're not talking about, you know, when we deal with a you know, traumatizing event and we'll get shaken up a little bit. Everyone goes through these brief, small periods of, you know, feeling down. You know, we're not talking about that. that that's normal if it happens every once in a while, especially due to certain circumstances in our life. But we're going to actually talk about, you know, clinical depression and clinical anxiety. And when we're talking about it, we got to first define these two terms. And when you're looking at depression, um, obviously it's having a, you know, depressed, a sad, empty feeling, you know, loss of interest or pleasure. But the key here is for two or more weeks. And also, too, you have to have at least four of the following symptoms to be truly um, have depression disorder. And those symptoms are any one of these, you know, either sleeping too much or not sleeping at all. Either you're having a, uh, you know, diminished interest in activities that you usually find uh, interest in. You're going to have feelings of guilt, worthlessness, you know, not only a loss of energy and having fatigue, but your, your, uh, your appetite's messed up. You're either increasing eating too much or eating too little. You're losing the ability to concentrate. Anxiety. You're either anxiety and anxious or you're super slow and you're just kind of having these, uh, having a lot of your thought process is a lot slower and depressed. Also too, recurrent thoughts of suicide. So any four of any of those plus the top one, you have depression. And Anxiety, you're going to find out it's, it's very similar. Anxiety disorder, you're talking about restlessness, feeling wound up, easily fatigued, but also too having uh, difficulty concentrating. I mean, if you met anyone with anxiety, they can't concentrate at all. Give them a book and it's like, okay, that's not going to happen. Okay. Uh, muscle tension, they're very irritable. Difficulty controlling the worry, they're always worrying about something. And I like this quote here kind of sums up both of the terms here. If you are depressed, you are living in the past. If you are anxious, you are living in the future. If you are at peace, you are living in the present. And that it's, it's a good one because it really kind of hits home with a lot of people there. And when we're talking about this, is there even a problem going on with depression and anxiety? True depression and true anxiety. And let's look at the stats here because depression alone Worldwide, affecting 350 million people. True depression. In the U.S. alone, 15.7 million people 18 or older. So that's a significant amount. One in 10 Americans are clinically diagnosed, but again, clinically diagnosed, that severely underestimates the problem because so many people have this that don't go to a doctor and get clinically diagnosed. So it's hard to measure those in proper stats. And you're looking, this is probably the stat that pisses me off the most, 254 million prescriptions for antidepressants in 2010 alone. Now that's crazy and it makes it the second most prescri prescribed class of medication behind what? Anyone know? Yeah. Cholesterol lowering yeah. drugs, which is another crock of BS, but yeah. that was in my cholesterol talk, okay? So that, that <laughs> we'll go through that another day. Now anxiety is the most common mental illness in the United States. 40 million Americans 18 or over have it. And you're talking about 18% clinically diagnosed. Estimates rank it probably around more like 30% of the population. Because again, clinically diagnosed and the people that have it are a different number. And so 15.7 million Americans depression, 40 million with anxiety. And so Let's look at the similarities. They both involve nervousness, irritability, problems sleeping, concentrating. It happens more, nearly twice as much in women. Half diagnosed with depression, in fact, are also diagnosed with anxiety. So a lot of times you're going to see in this talk that we're going to be kind of blending these two together because they're so similar and they also come from similar mechanisms. And again, when you're looking at this massive, what was it, 240 plus million medications being prescribed out, there's overwhelming evidence that these things are no better than a placebo. So when people take this drug, they feel like it's going to work. And 
it works. But they could do that with a sugar pill. When they feel like something's going to work, the placebo effect is very strong. And these, this evidence that we're going to share with you today, it's going to show you just that. Now, causes, because we got to find out what's causing this whole thing, you know, and we're going to talk about the science, what the science actually says, but what does the pharmaceutical companies think that causes it? They think it's a chemical imbalance in the brain. And so what do they want to do? They want to prescribe drugs to correct that chemical imbalance. So it's perfect strategy for the pharmaceutical industries. But there's, not, there's no science supports this. You know, they say that they made this theory, this chemical imbalance theory, because it's a massive marketing gimmick for, you know, shipping out expensive and toxic antidepressants, you know, in the millions, in the hundreds of millions. You're talking, you know, Xanax, Lexapro, I mean, there's so many different antidepressants out there. And this is the theory they went along with. When you look at this figure, these two knobs are like one nerve communicating with another nerve. Those little red dots there is serotonin. And serotonin's like your mood enhancer hormone. It's your feel good hormone, you know. Serotonin's the big one here. And so what they do is their theory is they're gonna give you a drug that blocks the reuptake. So if you look at the figure at the right and you see a lot more red dots, that's what these antidepressants do. The problem is that there's never been any science supporting that it was due to low serotonin in the first place. And that's what we're gonna talk about because this theory is incorrect. Yeah, I mean, it's a good theory, but it's not proven. And so what is proven? You know, in 1983, and you know, this is 33 years ago, the National Institute of Mental Health, they came out with this saying, and they looked at a systemic analysis of all the research. There is no evidence that there is anything wrong in the serotonergic system of depressed patients. They're saying that there's no evidence that it's due to low serotonin. You know, and so then, that was in 83, but the pharmaceutical industry just went in the opposite path and they took off with it. But obviously, if they can sell two to 300 million antidepressants a year, you know, it's a good marketing strategy. But then further research in 2009 said again, there's no evidence of this low serotonin theory. Now, instead of finding out, you know, uh, theories of causes, we're going to talk about two major ones that science is based on that we can both apply strategies to implement immediately. Sound good to you guys? Okay, so the two proven causes is one, a low amount of something called neurotrophic factors. And the second one is chronic inflammation. And we're going to go over each one of these in detail. Because what they found out is that these neurotrophic factors, it's a family of these proteins that support you know, growth, survival, differentiation of brain cells. It's responsible for normal brain functioning. And in fact, these neurotrophic factors are necessary for neuroplasticity to take place. Now I know there's a lot of terms here. Neuroplasticity is the making of brand new brain cells. And we can easily do that, but you have to have neurotrophic factors in place in order there. So you need neurotrophic factors to have neuroplasticity, to have normal functioning. They found out that, so again, neurotrophic factors are a family of proteins, the number one protein, the number one neurotrophic factor involved in depression is something called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's the main driver. It actually activates brain stem cells so you can make more and more new brain cells and have normal brain functioning. And we all know what growth hormone does in the body. It's responsible for healing, growth, and repair, for longevity, anti-aging, for keeping things new and fresh. Well, BDNF is your growth hormone for your brain. Very, very important. Vital role in memory. Now, the kicker is that in depression or any other degenerative brain disorder in anxiety, they have critically low levels of BDNF. Now, that's proven, okay? And so, what happens is that BDNF, if it's responsible for neuroplasticity, for making new brain cells, if you have critically low levels you're actually going to have brain shrinkage. And BDNF is especially um, located in the areas of the brain that regenerate the most. One of those areas, probably the most important, is the hippocampus. 
the hippocampus is located deep in the temporal lobes of the brain. And that's what's responsible for learning, memory, in this talk, mood regulation. Okay, so again, if we have critically low levels of BDNF, we're actually gonna have shrinkage of the hippocampus, which has to do with mood regulation. And so that's the whole driver here. So if we know that increasing this substance, increasing BDNF can delay and reverse any decrease in brain function, any neurodegenerative disorder, the question now becomes, what can we do to increase BDNF, the very important substance? And there's three things. Number one, like I've talked about almost every single talk, is intermittent fasting. Science shows up to 400% increase in BDNF from applying intermittent fasting to your lifestyle. Number two, high intensity exercise. And again, I did a talk on this on YouTube, you can check it out. High intensity exercise, specifically what I've drawn out for you guys, is how you increase this substance. And more of what we're gonna talk about today is the, probably the only food source you can find is curcumin. And curcumin is the main active ingredient in turmeric. So turmeric is actually proven to increase BDNF. Now, when they did studies on turmeric, they compared one group taking turmeric, another taking, you know, the main antidepressant, Prozac. It's the exact same effectiveness. Exactly the same. So you're not seeing any benefits over the other, but do you think doctors are saying, all right, go ahead and take a tablespoon of turmeric a day and get out of my office? <laughs> you know, I don't think they're gonna be making very many profits that way, you know? So again, they're not doing this, even though it's the same effectiveness, and turmeric is actually makes you healthy. So, you know, conflict of interest much. But not only does it increase BDNF, but this turmeric, it increases other brain neurotransmitters, your serotonin, your dopamine, all your feel-good hormones, which is pretty important for any type of anxiety or depression. And the reason why turmeric has such big properties is that it's proven that once it gets absorbed into the system, it can cross your blood-brain barrier. So the ability for turmeric, special ability to actually cross that barrier is the reason why in the first place it can in increase BDNF, the different brain neurotransmitters, the serotonin, the dopamine. So this is huge. And so when we look at the science, this is out of brain research. I'm not gonna read this whole thing, but basically it's saying that people under chronic stress, they have down regulation of BDNF. So chronic stress lowers your, the amount of BDNF in the system. Now, when uh, it also says too, uh, the hippocampus and the frontal cortex actually shrink as a result of the decrease in BDNF that chronic stress causes. But then the good news is that um, curcumin administration actually blocks this entire process from taking place. Next one here, curcumin actually resulted in a dose-dependent increase in hippocampal, hippocampus BDNF. And then again, after they show all this stuff, it can be an effective and lasting natural antidepressant, you think, mm -hmm. but it's not used, which is unbelievable. And this is out of the journal Behavioral Brain Research. So to summarize this fact here, intermittent fasting, high intensity interval training, turmeric, that's gonna cause an increase in BDNF. That increase in BDNF then is gonna allow for normal brain functioning, better memory, recycling and rejuvenation of the brain tissue, neuroplasticity, the ability to make new brain cells. And that overall is gonna completely slash your risk of depression and anxiety. You know, so it's crazy people aren't doing this. And so again, to answer your question, how I personally do it, how I administer this is, you've got to first look at the bioavailability because turmeric itself is not very bioavailable in the body. So what you got to do is you got to combine it with black pepper because the um, piperine in the black pepper, it increases its bioavailability by 2000%. So you're taking that, I take the pepper and I'm just shaking it out, the grinder, and I mean, it tastes awesome, what can I say? Okay, so my, I wasn't going to share this, but my secret smoothie recipe of turmeric involves a frozen berries, a frozen banana. I do a full tablespoon of turmeric. Now, to answer the question, they don't like to show many uh, 
doses in the research. A lot of them show uh, that they're taking nearly a gram a day, and then some show even up to three is good. But literally, it's, it, it, I haven't seen any evidence that you can overdose on this stuff because it's just natural food. And so I do uh, um, a tablespoon. I read it somewhere that you know a tablespoon is probably one of the best things, and you have to put it in a smoothie. You can't shake it up in water. I mean, it's it's awful, <laughs> especially with the pepper. So. When you add like the frozen banana and you add the coconut oil, the coconut oil too, that healthy fat actually increases the absorption even more so. And I add coconut milk, I add cinnamon, and then again, as a option, you can add maca, cacao, chia seeds, which I personally do. But the, the frozen berries, the fruit, it kind of takes away the taste and it's actually pretty good. It's like a fruity smoothie but with a little spice to it, so whatever. Now, depression. This is the second cause. So we went over the BDNF, the neurotrophic link to depression and anxiety. Now we're gonna go over inflammation. And they show that chronic inflammation is actually the number one biological factor which is causing depression in the first place. And so when they took a look at people with clinical depression, they all found that they had elevated inflammatory cytokines, elevated inflammatory substances in the body, and they also had decreased cortisol sensitivity, which makes sense because cortisol is a stress hormone and it also has a huge anti-inflammatory effect. So if you're suffering with inflammation, you're gonna have less sensitivity to that. So it can't work as well and utilize its anti-inflammatory benefits. All the depressed patients had these two things. So we know inflammation's at the root of this. And by the way, curcumin, turmeric, not only does it increase BDNF, but is, is one of the most potent anti-inflammatories around. So you're covering both aspects with just taking turmeric. Now, other inflammatory factors, and we're going over common stuff that we can apply right now. One of the main ones is vitamin D deficiency. And this research looked at uh, subjects who were, had less than 20 nanograms per milliliter of vitamin D. Now I know that doesn't mean a lot to you guys, but you have to measure it yourself. You have to go and get your blood drawn and really know what you're dealing with here. Because ideally you want it between 50 and 70 nanograms per milliliter. That's like the ideal dose range. But anything under 20, which is actually quite common, you have 11 times more depression. And 11 times more depression, that, that's very, very significant. Now, also too, a unbalanced, unbalanced gut flora. When our gut is completely trashed, we're under chronic inflammation, we're gonna be depressed and we're gonna be anxious. And the thing is, what gets produced in the gut even more so than in the brain? Serotonin. Serotonin actually is produced by your gut bacteria. The network of nerves and gut bacteria there in your gut make by far the most majority of your serotonin. So if our gut is messed up, we're not making adequate amounts of our healthy feel-good hormones Again, contributing to anxiety, contributing to depression. And so, here, sugar. Sugar suppresses, not only does it destroy your gut, but it actually blocks BDNF formation as well. So, sugar, and we're talking excessive sugar here, but again, it facilitates the growth of horrible, your bad pathogenic microbes, and again, when you do that, you're losing your serotonin ability, which is your feel-good hormone in the first place, so obviously we gotta replace our processed foods with whole foods, but they gotta be organic. Because if they're not organic, if they're GMO, it's gonna have glyphosate. Glyphosate, not only is it a class two carcinogen, which means that we should probably avoid it anyway, it also destroys your gut microbiome. And if it destroys your gut microbiome, you're destroying your serotonin. Also too, it destroys tryptophan. It completely impairs amino acid synthesis. Tryptophan is your precursor to serotonin. So it's just like a double whammy. So when you're summarizing this whole thing, real whole foods gives you an optimized gut flora and you're gonna have adequate serotonin production, meaning you're not gonna have anxiety, you're not gonna have depression. Processed foods, sugar, genetically modified foods, it completely destroys your gut flora which means you're gonna have these disease-causing bacteria, yeast, fungi in the gut. Chronic inflammation happens as a result, decreased in BDNF, but also too, it also increases glutamate in the brain. 
Now, those two combined leads to agitation, depression, anger, anxiety, panic attacks. Sound familiar? We've all met people with this kind of stuff, and it's that easy. But doctors don't say this. It's so easy. And so, kind of going back to our earlier conversation, omega-3 fats is so vital in this equation. And we're gonna probably go over things you may have not heard of, but when you're looking at omega-3s, you got EPA, you got DHA, and you have ALA. So basically what you're looking at here is, hang on, I'll go back to this, but EPA and DHA are marine animal based. ALA is plant-based omega-3s. So vegetarians out there aren't getting the marine animal EPA and DHA. And here's why this is important. Because greater than 90% of your omega-3 fat found in your brain tissue is DHA. Over 90%. So if you're only consuming ALA, you're missing a huge building block to your brain. Not only that, 30% of the fatty mass in your prefrontal cortex, which again has to do with learning new things, memory, concentration, 30% DHA. So the other omega-3 fats, so say that we only consume ALA, the plant-based omega-3, over and over again, and don't consume the marine-based ones. Well, they, they actually showed that, and it actually didn't even change brain composition. So ALA is not, you're not gonna increase the amount of ALA in your brain, basically, if you just consume that. So you're not able to contribute to those building blocks if you're just consuming plant-based alone. And they're not interchangeable. And so we can't get, our, we can't get the proper omega-3s from ALA alone. And thing is, ALA is vastly abundant in your diet. Everyone gets it. It's in nuts, seeds, I mean, it's in so many different foods that we really don't need to supplement with ALA. However, EPA and DHA, not many people are eating healthy, fatty, wild fish every day. You know, not only that, it's very hard to come by now with the mercury, with all the heavy metal toxicity. So it's hard to get and it's very expensive. So not everyone is getting that. Now, ALA is a source of energy. EPA and DHA are not energy. It's actually a structural element. And this is, this, this is the most fascinating thing I learned researching this. There's a guy named Nils Holm, PhD and the leading scientist in omega-3 phospholipids. And he, what he did is he had different subjects consume EPA and DHA and different subjects consume ALA. And so you'd have them consume it and then you would measure their blood level of those phospholipids after. And they found out that when you consume EPA and DHA, the blood levels stay high in that phospholipid for over three days. So I take it three days from now, it's still gonna be high in those omega-3s. ALA, completely different. Less than 10 hours, fastly absorbed. And again, it's because ALA is an energy source where EPA and DHA, that time, that over three day period it's taking in your bloodstream, it's because your body's spending so much time distributing it, redistributing it to different areas of the brain, all your cell membranes, to make sure it's part of that structure. So it takes a while for it to distribute in these areas where we vastly use up the ALA. And, you know, and so, again, when you're looking at this, oh, plant-based omega-3s, because we gotta look at the structure. Why are these so different? You have 18 carbons in these. So they call these basically a short chain omega-3, where marine bases are between 20 and 22 carbons. They're long chains. And this is kind of the structure. You can see the top two are the longer ones, the marine-based omega-3s. The lower one is the ALA, the plant base. And so when you have a change in structure like that, you're gonna have a completely change in function. And there, yes, it is true. Some people, you know, especially like vegetarians and others, they're going to say, well, can't you convert your ALA into EPA and DHA? And that's actually true. There is a chemical reaction in your body where ALA can get converted to your main healthy ones that we need. However, it's only about 0.1 to 0.5% that's actually converted because the enzyme that does that is extremely impaired. And so that's not nearly enough to really even do anything. 
So we got to get it from fish base. I mean, literally, our hunter gatherers, they were always getting wild caught fish. You know, it's hard to get now, but it doesn't mean it's less important. And so, when you're talking about the dosage of this kind of stuff, heart health, they recommend up to 1,000 milligrams per day of EPA and DHA. If we have high triglycerides, they've showed 2,000 to 3,000 milligrams per day. For depression, two, they've done studies all the way as low as 200, which I wouldn't recommend, to all the way up to is 2,500 milligrams per day. So again, it's hard to find people with just recommending just a straight dose. I would personally recommend more towards the higher end because you really can't overdo it on omega-3, on omega-3s, but again, this is what the science shows and this is what the research is on. And different supplementation for depression, for anxiety, I, I personally don't recommend any of these. However, if you're on an antidepressant, I think this could be a good strategy in getting off your antidepressants temporarily and then go on more of the natural stuff. But you're talking like things like SAM-E, which is an amino acid derivative. That's been proven to help with depression. 5-HTP, which is a serotonin precursor. I'm just not a fan of giving your body these artificial chemicals to make new chemicals even though it's still better than pharmaceuticals, I, I still am just not a big fan of long-term use of this kind of stuff. St. John's wort, vitamin, 12, vitamin B12 is great, especially if you're vegetarian, you, it's a must because that's only found in meat sources. So this is huge. And so when you're summarizing everything, number one thing we gotta look at our diet. You gotta avoid GMOs, excessive grains, processed foods. We gotta consume more whole foods. Brain health, you gotta have healthy fats. Your brain is over 90% fat. You gotta give it the healthy fats it needs. DHA is the big one there. Omega-3 fats, and that's gonna be wild fish. Krill is excellent. Vitamin D, aim to have your blood level at 50 to 70 nanograms per milliliter. Your gut health, not only do you gotta have fermented foods, probiotics, but you gotta have a healthy nerve supply to the gut, vital. Because those both things, again, the gut microbes make the serotonin, but it all has to do with the network of nerves connecting the brain and the gut to actually increase the brain neurotransmitter as well, the serotonin. Exercise, high intensity interval training. If you haven't seen that talk, watch it and apply it. It's easy, anyone can do it. You can do it with a walking regimen. So watch that talk, it's another way to increase BDNF. And you also gotta address your stress because stress lowers BDNF and chronic, exactly. And again, with the brain health, I mean, with the omega-3s, they even did studies on Harvard medical students and they gave them omega-3s versus half the Harvard medical students giving them a placebo, just so kind of like a water pill. They fared so much better with their anxiety and everything, plus a whole lot less inflammation. And there's tons of studies out there like this. So the stuff really is big time. But a lot of times they're either taking too little of a dose or they're not taking it at all. Or their omega-6s compared to the omega-3s are just way too high. And that means that if omega-6s are inflammatory and omega-3s are anti-inflammatory, if you consume way too much omega-6s, it's gonna ruin the effect. So it's all about that ratio. And the last thing I want to leave you guys tonight is that chiropractic adjustments, they not only affect your brain health and your gut health, but they also r radically reduce the stress response. So chiropractic and all of this is, plays a huge vital role. And uh, that's what I got for you guys today. I have a ton of references on here, so feel free to check any of those out. It'll be on the YouTube channel. Thanks for coming out. Thank you. Yeah. What do you consider intermittent fasting? Intermittent fasting is, you know, they've done studies on continuous fasting, you know, for days on end, three or more days, and they found out that that was the only lifestyle intervention that increased lifespan. Now, what then they did recent research that intermittent fasting actually has very similar benefits. And intermittent fasting is where you restrict your eating window each day. So you're basically, instead of eating around the clock once you wake up till when you go to bed, you're restricting your eating window to eight hours or less is usually the most common way of doing it.
but it's basically not eating all around the clock. So overnight? What? Overnight? Well, overnight, everyone doesn't sleep overnight. I mean, everyone doesn't eat overnight. Right. But that's, par that's, that's eight hours of your fasting period. But you also got to add another eight hours. Eight yeah. Hours. So, so what I recommend is skipping breakfast. I know what you're thinking. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Exactly. Oh my gosh. No, it's not. No. In fact, if you look at where that started from, in 1800s, I think it was like mid or late 1800s, they actually show it. If you even go to like QuakerOatmeal.com and you look at their timeline of their existence, in like 18 something, shows the mass advertising campaign for making breakfast the most important meal of the day. And guess what? General Mills, everyone took off with it and everyone was selling breakfast cereals and everything was hunky-dory. Yeah, but there's... No. No, I mean, did our ancestors wake up and have a big old breakfast of pancakes when they woke up? <laughs> Is it true that the body can only heal on an empty stomach? Yes, and I'll tell you why. When you're sick, is our appetite up or down? down. Yeah, but what do we do? We try to force feed ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. But does our body make mistakes? No. no. Reason why we don't have appetite is because our body's healing itself. You know? But I just remember when I was sick, my mom would force feed me like cinnamon sugar toast and stuff, you know? And like, <laughs> that's like the worst possible thing no, you could absolutely do. Either, right? So it's like, really like listen to your body. You know, your body isn't lying to you. But that's exactly why when we're sick, we have no appetite.